Okay, this is part two of five. Um, in this section, we're going to look at discrete time Markov chains still, but we're going to look at their long run behavior. And what we mean by long run behavior is we said that a discrete time Markov chain is a sequence of random variables along with their joint distribution. Okay, and we are really just interested to know what happens when we move along the marginal distributions up until infinity. Um, when we were looking at the uh, no claims discount example in the spreadsheet from part one, um, you'll see in the spreadsheet that I recommend that you take the, one of the later distributions and put that as your initial condition. And you'll actually see that the uh, distribution di uh, converges quite quickly. Um, okay, so by definition, um, a stationary probability distribution, pi j, uh, is just a vector of numbers equal to the number of states of the Markov chain um, with the following, where the following conditions hold. Uh, pi is equal to pi times the probability matrix. All values are greater than zero and they sum to one. Okay, number one can also be written as pi is equal to pi p, where p is the transition matrix. If this was true for a probability distribution, just keep in mind that that actually means that all the marginal distributions are the same. So what I mean by that is um, we know that x4 um, is equal to pi p to the power of 4. Uh, but if this condition holds because matrix multiplication is associative, we can rewrite it like this. That collapses to pi p cubed. And if you just keep applying um, this property that we have of the matrix, you'll see that it e equals to pi. So um, when we have our initial distribution equal to the stationary distribution, all the marginals become the same. And that's actually what you get to see in the spreadsheet. Keep in mind, in a different part of the notes, they talk about stationary probability distributions more generally, and there is a relationship between the two, um, but it's probably worth you figuring that out yourself. Uh, it's quite a simple relationship. There's a reason the names are the same. Um, okay, we move on to definition 2.2. A Markov chain is reducible given that any pair of the Markov chain of states, um, there exists at least one integer for which the probability of moving between them is non-zero. So this is saying take any pair of states of the probability, dis probability distribution. If at some point in time there's a non-zero probability of moving from one to the other, then if that's true for any pair, then the whole chain is called irreducible. Um, so intuitively, it just means, is it possible at some point in time, even if it's not possible for most of time, is it just possible at some point in time to get from anywhere to anywhere else? So that's the intuitive explanation for irreducibility of a chain. Uh, let's look at an example to explain irreducibility. Consider a discrete time mark of chain with five states. Uh, and the one-step probability matrix given as follow. First, draw the one-step prob probability diagram. Um, then we ask ourselves, is the chain irreducible? And then we ask ourselves uh, to find the stationary distribution as we've defined it in 2.1. Okay, I will give you, there was a flash of the answer there, uh, but I'll give you a second to just try it yourself first uh, before I give you the answers. Okay. Um, here on the right, I've drawn the transition diagram that covers uh, number one. You can see um, with just a few states, it can get quite complicated. And you can, you know, just to appreciate that matrix multiplication keeps track of all the possibilities of moving between states over time. It becomes really easy to make mistakes if you had to count all the possible ways of getting between uh, two and five over a period of 10 iterations but matrix multiplication makes sure that everything is done 100% every time. Um, we now ask whether the Markov chain is irreducible. Um, well, no, because, 
you should be able to see from the picture that if you leave the, the, the two, four pair, there's never any way to get back. If you look at states one, three, and five, all arrows are between themselves. So no, because it is never possible to get um, the probability of getting to state two, given that you were in state five, is zero for all n and t, where t is less than n. Really just saying, um, we only have to find one counterexample, and that is to say you can't get from five to two, but you could have picked any pair. You could have picked one and four, you could have picked three and two, obviously. So it's just enough to show one counterexample. But it is worth pu putting out the reasoning in a little bit more detail. The chain is not irreducible. Because we're always making an argument from the state to the whole chain. Hope that makes sense. Uh, the next step asks you to calculate the stationary distribution. The way you do that is we want to solve pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, pi 4, pi 5. That is, th those are the values we want. It's a uh, one for every state. Multiply that with the matrix P equal to pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, pi 4, pi 5. So if you multiply it out, you'll just get five equations with five unknowns, a simple, simple set of simultaneous equations. Um, and you'll actually see in exams that normally um, the examiners are a little bit cheeky and they'll give you a relatively easy question like this to calculate, but it will be a lot of work. There's you know, five equations to solve. Um, so don't get too excited if a question looks a little bit too easy in the, in the exam. Um, well, I'm not going to multiply out the detail, but I know the answer will look like this. Where this is state one, two, three, four, five. And as you will see um, in the theorem soon, the stationary distribution, once it's calculated under some conditions is actually the long run distribution. So it's no surprise that for states two and four, we actually find that in the long run, it's impossible to be in those states because at some point you'll leave and you'll never be able to come back. And that there's a non-zero number for one, three, and five. The fact that they're all equal to exactly a third, same, to, same value as each other, that is a little bit less obvious. Uh, but the fact that it's non-zero uh, is not surprising. And if you, uh, this, is, this is what the, the little fact I try to communicate in the spreadsheet, the, the no, no claims discount spreadsheet. If you take a distribution a little bit further down the line and you make it your initial distribution, you'll actually see that all the marginal distributions converge to the same thing, as we have seen um, over here. Once your initial distribution is your stationary distribution, under some conditions, not always, it will multiply out to make all the marginals the same. Okay, on to definition 2.3. A state is said to be periodic with a period larger of, of value larger than one, strictly larger. If the state um, is possible only in a number of steps that is an integer multiple of D. A state I is aperiodic if it is not periodic, and an entire chain is said to be aperiodic if every state is aperiodic. Uh, the numbering in, in the next step is incorrect. It's in 2.1. Well, let's just look at, um, let's just look at state one, for example. So uh, if you're in state one, you have to leave to either three or to five. There's no possibility of staying there. So is it possible for, to get back to one in one step? No, because it's impossible because of this probability zero. Is it possible in two steps? Yes, you could go to three and back to one. Um, is it possible in four steps? Yes, it's possible in five as well. So 
coming back to stage one, there is no uh, integer value by which that's possible. So therefore, state one is a periodic. Um, and it's, I think it's quite similar with some of the other states. Um, actually, looking at state two, getting back to state two in one step is not possible. Getting back in two steps is possible, going to four and then coming back to two. Is it possible to come back to two in three steps? Um, no, once you leave the four um, two combination, you can not ever go back. Um, so it is possible to come back in four, but not in five. So that actually tells me that two is periodic with period two. Okay. Theorem 2.1 says that if a Markov chain is irreducible, then all the same states have the same period. No proof required. Okay, Theorem 2.2. If the state space of a Markov chain is finite, then the chain has at least one stationary distribution. Moreover, if a Markov chain is finite and irreducible, then the chain has a unique stationary distribution. Moreover, still, if a Markov chain is finite, irreducible, and aperiodic, then the chain has a stationary, stationary distribution, but the long run behavior of that distribution will conform to the stationary distribution. Um, no proof is required for the statement, um, but when you use it in exams, you have to quote it. Um, don't quote it by number, just quote it by stating it. Um, you'll often just need. Um, this last bit, this last bit is probably the most important part of the theorem and comes up most often. Okay, here I have just written out explicitly what we mean by long-term behavior, just in terms of a limit. Okay, you can click on this link or copy this link. Um, it's a nice example um, of where the long run distribution of a Markov chain um, helps us solve some other problems. Um, I just want to point out that in this example, um, we, the, in the chess example, the states are not aperiodic. So you can't actually use our theorem to decide on the long run behavior or to make claims about the long run behavior. But I, just keep in mind that the converse isn't true. If your chain is irreducible and say periodic, that doesn't mean that the long run behavior is not the stationary distribution or that the long run behavior doesn't exist. The theorem says nothing about that. So actually in this example, the long run behavior definitely still exists. It's just that we can't use theorem 2.2. Um, and they also talk about holding times in a, in a discrete time mark of chain, which is something we don't cover in this course. It's quite a simple idea, um, but we don't actually cover it explicitly. But despite that, it is still a brilliant example to have a look at. We now look at our main example um, to cover the points on uh, periodicity, uh, irreducibility, and stationary distributions. It all comes together in this question. Um, and this is an old institute uh, exam question. And I think you'll see that it takes quite a bit of thinking to, to get to your one-step transition probability matrix. So um, let's, let's go through the details. Every person has two chromosomes, each being a copy of one of the chromosomes from one of their parents. There are two types of chromosomes labeled X and Y. A child born with an X and a Y chromosome is male, and a child born with two X chromosomes is a female. A blood clotting disorder, hemophilia, is caused by a defective X chromosome, we call it X star. A female with a defective chromosome is not usually exhibiting any symptoms of the disease, but may pass the defective gene onto her children and so is known as a carrier. A male with a defective chromosome suffers from the disease and is known as a hemophiliac. Um, this model was actually uh, used, or the reasoning of this model was actually used to show that Queen Victoria uh, was the person who, who carried hemophilia into the bloodline of many royal families in Europe. 
More information for the question. A medical researcher wishes to study the progression of the disease through the firstborn child in every generation. So those are our states. We got, we, the states are the, the, um, the disease status for every firstborn child going through the generations, where over time you're st stepping through the firstborn child, starting with a female carrier. You may assume that every patient has an equal chance of passing on their chromosomes to their children. That is actually uh, a realistic assumption. The partner of each person in the study does not carry a defective X chromosome, which is also a pretty good study. It's quite a rare disease. So normally if you pick a random person from the population as a partner, there will not be hemophilia in there and no new genetic defects occur. Again, quite a realistic assumption given that the genetic condition is quite rare. We are going to, just with the information we've got, quickly set out the one-step transition probability matrix. That's always the starting point for these questions because they, it's not just a useful graphic way of showing uh, your model. It is actually, as we said, a formal definition of a random, the three time random process. So just to give you some help, um, there are four possible states that a, a person, a firstborn child could be in. Either you are a healthy baby girl with no um, defects, or a healthy boy, you could be a carrier, which is, we said, that is actually the starting point of this process, starting with a female carrier, or you could be a male with a gene which is called hemophilia. Obviously, um, because of this assumption, the partner of every person um, in the study um, does not carry the defective chromosome, once the chromosome is out, say for both of this example and this example, um, we know that their partners will be healthy. So that's a one-way street. There is, um, and we also know that every parent has an equal chance of passing their genes on to children. So once you're a healthy boy or a healthy girl, your partner is going to be healthy and there's a 50-50 chance that you'll get a boy or a girl. So there we already have some arrows. I'm now going to leave it to you before you, you go on to the next slide to fill in the remainder of the arrows in this diagram. So pause the video now. Okay, here we've got um, the diagram that I started. Here we said, you know, we already uh, use our first two assumptions to calculate these. Uh, you'll see there's a little bit of an asymmetry um, in this diagram. Let's start with the easiest case. If you're a carrier, you know to have a baby, your partner has to be a healthy male. So if, there, if this woman gives her carrier gene, there's a quarter chance that she'll stay in the state if the, if the man gives his X chromosome. If the um, woman gives her unhealthy chromosome but the man gives his Y chromosome, we move down to this state. Um, if the carrier gives her healthy X, then you can either have a healthy boy or a healthy baby girl, depending on what the man, the healthy man partner gives. One that you just have to think about a little more is the, the, the carrier example. The partner has to be a woman. Um, and for that reason, you cannot actually stay in the state. If the man gives his um, his defective gene, his partner only has a healthy X to give. And because there's a healthy X, it means that this person either, uh, that this person will actually move to the carrier uh, state. If the partner gives the Y, then you will have a, a, a man and that is the only option. You can only have a, have a baby boy. So there are only two options to go from the carrier state uh, and then we assign a 50-50 probability to each of those. Cool, so just involved a little bit of thinking. We now ask the question, is this chain irreducible? Well, you'll have to either show it for every possible pair or find a counter example. And it's easy to say no, because um, cannot, 
move from xx to x star x because no new mutations is the pain the the chain a periodic well the moment you have a non-zero probability uh, of staying in a state it has to be a periodic because you can always just stay in the state um, the only question is this one you can't stay in the state in a step of one but you can get back here in three by going one two in other words staying in that state and then coming back for three. So that's chain as is all that state is also a periodic. So yes. And then you'll give your reasoning for states with identity arrows. It's clearly a periodic. For state X star Y, steps are possible in two, three, four, five, and so on. And therefore the whole chain is aperiodic. The next step still asks you to calculate the stationary distribution, even though we won't now automatically from the information that we've got know whether that's a long run distribution. It may be, or it may not be. We've got aperiodicity sorted, but we don't have irreducibility sorted, and we do have the finite condition holding. So calculate the stationary distribution. Again, it's multiplying, it's gonna be four um, expressions with four unknowns. And it looks as follows. And if you solve it, you'll actually find what you would expect is um, if this is the, depends on obviously what, how you label the state. So if this is, this first step is the carrier, then the hemophiliac, then a boy, then I think it's labeled it girl, boy. If that's how we labeled each of these states, then we would kind of expect, well, firstly, we'll expect a unique stationary distribution because it's a finite uh, chain. Um, we will expect to find in the long run that no one becomes a carrier or hemophiliac because once you leave those states, you can't come back and that there's a 50-50% chance of being a boy and a girl. And if you multiply it out, I hope that is what you'll get.